Welcome to Beyond By Wings, the business side of dentistry, brought to you by Edwards & Associates PC. Join us as we discuss how to build your dental practice, optimize your income, and plan for your future. This podcast is distributed with the understanding that Edwards & Associates PC is not rendering legal, accounting, or professional advice. Listeners should consult with their business advisors before acting on any of the information that is shared. At Edwards & Associates PC, our business is the business of dentistry. For help or more information, visit our website at enassociates.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of Beyond Bite Wings. And this is part two to our last episode with Mr. Rick Williford, where we were talking about KPIs and analytics. Uh, without further ado, Mr. Wilford, that good. While we're talking overhead, let me give you an example. I went to a meeting one time a couple of years ago where a well-known national consultant said, well, guys, our calculations now are showing that dental supplies are running about 9.3%. I said, what? Wow. Are you crazy? <laughs> of course, what they were doing, which I think is absolutely wrong, they were measuring their expense ratio, looking at collections after all these write-offs. And so I gave them an example. Suppose you've got two offices in the same dental building. They're both collecting a million dollars. One of them, though, spends $60,000 on dental supplies. And so his overhead is running 6% for dental supplies, like it used to 30 or 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. The other guy is showing 9% overhead. And we said, wait, what's going on here? And it turns out the first guy doesn't take any PPOs. So he produces a million. Mm -hmm. He essentially collects, you know, a million, 98% of a million. Mm -hmm. The poor guy eating up with PPOs for him to collect a million, he has to produce 1.5 million. And so if he takes his $90,000 of dental supplies, because he, remember, he thinks he got 9% overhead mm -hmm. and the supply guy's cheating him and stuff like that, or the staff is stealing dental supplies or whatever. Mm -hmm. I said, wait a minute, I think you're measuring it wrong. You should take that $90,000 and divide it not by an, a million dollar collections, but divide it by your UCR standard fee of 1.5 million production and Shazam, that's 6%, just like in the old days. Dental supplies are still running 6% if you measure it properly. Keep in mind that production creates overhead. Yes, collections pays the overhead, but for statistical calculation purposes, you don't want to base it on collections. Now, for internal purposes, you could, just to keep life simple, a lot of the doctors no longer know what their UCR production is. And so it's fine to take your QuickBooks number, which will be based on collections, but there you need to get your percentage proper and say for your practice doctor, you should budget 9.3% of your collections, as this consultant said, for your dental supplies. But remember, if we did the math right, you're only paying 6% of production. You're right on the same number, but it's easier to measure collections. But you can't have it both ways. You can't get a hernia trying to get your dental supplies down to 6% of collections. Just use the right number. But what that's going to mean is, you may recall in the old days, you heard that overhead should be, say, 60%. Well, for a big PPO practice, based on collections, perhaps their overhead should be 85%. Based on UCR, it still is 60%. But based on the simple way to do it with your QuickBooks, 85% is not a bad number. 
but that's also why you're losing your shirt and you're in a bad mood all the time. Right. So, yes, that's true. I completely agree with you. So we were talking about, about patience. The busy, busy practice really focuses on the number of new patients he gets in every month. Mm -hmm. The other kind of practice looks to see, though, how many net new patients did they get? You'll see an office that has 60 new patients and everybody's thrilled doing high fives in the hallway, but you come along as the consultant and, and Robert's kind of a wet blanket and says, yeah, but guys, did you notice you lost 50 patients mm -hmm. this month? You only had a net gain of 10 patients. Who's closing the back door? These are the people that no longer qualify as active patients. They came once, got something done, and they left. Mm -hmm. But they're not in the recare program. They're not sticking around. And look at all the time you wasted being busy, busy, servicing those 60 new patients. But you lost 40 or 50. I would rather slow it down. Why not go back to the old days? and get maybe 25 or one doctor, 25 or so good, quote, I hate to use the word quality, new patients. I mean, those that agree with you philosophically, they'll accept your treatment, they, they appreciate your treatment, et cetera. Just get 25 new patients and lose four. Look at all the effort you saved mm -hmm. and how much more you're going to find you're producing per visit with those, quote, better patients where you can slow it down and your focus is on being productive. And a lot of folks dream of maybe getting out of some of the PPOs, but they're terrified and they're convinced they can't. And I know Robert, they have some, some good language skills, a good plan to spend six or eight, nine months in advance, talking about this, going through some steps. And if you're interested and you're, you're mad enough about the 85% overhead <laughs> based on collections, then there are ways you can leave the plans appropriately. And by the way, we probably want to avoid the term, we drop Delta. No, no, we changed our relationship with Delta. <laughs> Sounds a little classier. That's and what we discovered time and again, time and again, time and again, a year later, after you drop Delta, 81% of those patients are still going to be there. But now they're paying closer to your UCR standard fee. And you're not being hassled by some 18-year-old clerk at Delta arguing about in your case presentation and your diagnosis and all the other hassles that get involved with that. <clears throat> and so if you're willing and you have some personality to do that, then Robert can show you and make you believe if it's true <laughs> that your patients love you more than you give yourself credit for. They also trust you compared to some of these folks you see on TV. They've had some friends go in with a single toothache and they came back with a diagnosis of three crowns, getting over-treated, things like that. So they, they sense something is going on because if you take a 40% haircut and a reduction in your collections, essentially, because <laughs> of your being in network, I hate to say it, but you've got to game the system to make a profit. And that's where some of the big boys get in trouble. And a lot of the patients somehow sense something is going on there. They're not getting the, the quality or the attention or the time or something that they used to get. So that's a whole other conversation I'd love for us to have. And maybe that could be part of the topic of another meeting. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And I'm sure our listeners would love to hear that on uh, how to go about 
because honestly, it's not something that can be implemented overnight. It does require some supervision from a professional. Typically, the course is about two years for it to be fully implemented, and it needs to be done in phases. But I absolutely agree. I mean, it's actually a pretty hot topic these days, consideration of dropping out of PPOs. Yeah, yeah. So... No, thank you for that bit, Mr. Wilford. Now, there was also one other thing I wanted to touch upon just a little bit that we talked about earlier. I remember you in our meeting mentioning that, you know, active patients are defined by ADA as a patient that has walked in at least once in the last 18 months. So when somebody's pulling up a report and looking at, oh, these are the number of real active patients I have, would that number really be real? if they're not considering this other factor in that we don't. Well, it just points out the fact with everything else we've said, you've got to define your terrors. Mm -hmm. Dentrix, Eaglesoft, Open Dental, all, all the others. In your system, you have, quote, active patients of record, meaning people you have not inactivated, you've not archived, et cetera, and so for a solo practice, depending on how long you've been in practice and whether you clean out that once in a while, you could show, you know, 6,000, quote, active patients according to your software. But you've got to run the filters right and say, no, 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 no. Tell me how many active I, patients I have if I mean they were seen at least once in the last 18 months. Oh, now that drops down to 1,600, 1,800, some number like that is more reasonable. And we want to look at that, that difference between those two numbers. What if we could reclaim 20%, 10% of those folks mm -hmm. who are no longer active, active, then there's be some revenue right there without, you know, doing any marketing or anything else. Right. Enhancing the revenue again with just by looking at some of these reports and pulling out some of these um, performance indicators. Yep, yep. You know, not just looking at your active patients, but truly figuring out what your real active patient numbers are. Right. By playing through the filters. And then, you know, when you truly realize, okay, okay, I have the real active patient numbers here, but then I'm also seeing these non-active patients. And can I do something with these numbers? Can I... Right have my team members maybe reach out to some of them, even if my success rate is about 5%, the <laughs> right. increase right. in the revenue would really help out, right? you know, with minimal expense. Yep. Yep. So most people think of KPIs as production last month, collections last month, number of new patients. I say... What drives those KPIs? What made the production the way it is? Mm -hmm. Why? And so I talk about some other KPIs your mama didn't tell you about, maybe. <laughs> what, percent? what percent of your new patients each month sign up and enroll in your recare program? Right. Is it 90% or is it 50%? If it's only 50%, that may tell you something about the kind of patient you're attracting. Or, yeah, you, know, you could be in emergency practice. You're open 24 hours a day, et cetera. And that could be a fantastic number for you. Or if you're a Medicaid practice, a lot of those folks, you know, don't appreciate so much the recare. They just want to get out of pain. They can't afford the other, perhaps or they have trouble getting off work, they don't have transportation, for whatever reason, for Medicaid is what I meant, of course, mm -hmm. that maybe 10% would be good. Back to the dream, what kind of practice did you want to have? Right. And so what should that ratio be? What percent? Mm -hmm. Then let's look to see, of those active patients, what's the vitality of those? If I wanted to buy your practice, mm -hmm. first of all, don't insult me and tell me you're selling me 6,000 active patients. We didn't say patients of record. We meant who's really coming in every 18 months or within 18 months. 
Mm-hmm. So we clarify that. But of those patients, the 1,800 patients say, we find in a lot of cases, a third of those have no future appointment. Mm-hmm. That would scare me to death if I was evaluating buying your practice or not. A third of your, quote, active patients don't have a future appointment. Well, how much business is there then? But I'd say let's break that down a little more, and we'll see how many active patients canceled or broke appointments in the last six months and have not reappointed. Those are people with no future appointment. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to insult you and suggest you go back 20 years. I mean, just look at the last six months. Why haven't they all reappointed? Or of your, quote, active patients, how many of them only had one or two appointments in 18 months? I mean, they're just barely hanging on by their toenails. They obviously haven't come in for recare and things like that. So if I was buying your practice or if you're looking at your active patients, those don't seem very active to me. That's Another right. big thing to look for is for folks who are in the recare program, your software typically already sets up a due date for them. If they came in last month, your software should be set up to automatically set up a due date, six months or three or four months if perio related. And so they've got a due date in the future. How many of those don't have an appointment? Those folks were at risk of wandering off. You let them out of the office. Maybe an airline pilot or somebody didn't know his schedule. You're at his mercy waiting for him two years from now to decide, you know, I haven't been to the dentist in a while. Maybe I should check in. Or they'll check in with another dentist. You need to capture as many of those as you can before they leave the office. Mm-hmm. Even if it's just a temporary placeholder, and you agree to call them in five months and renegotiate that once they do really know their appointment. But don't just throw up your hands and let them walk out of the practice. But then another KPI, look back to the specific patients who were new patients nine months ago, that cohort of whatever, 50 new patients, specifically in that ninth month, And we look back at 18 months. Now, let's see what percent of those are still active. Mm. If you look at the 18-month window, just those patients, not the average number of patients per month, blah, blah, that specific cohort of patients, you may find only 28% are still active. I don't think I'd be impressed if I was going to buy your practice. And so those are some numbers to look at. Of the patients who have a due date this month, let's say there's 100 patients have a due date this month. What percent of them have an appointment either this month or in the future? Life gets in the way. Next month, next month, next month. What percent of them? Is it 90% of folks with a due date this month? have an appointment, or only 50%. And if your numbers in all these KPIs I'm talking about are at the lower end of the scale, that may beg the question of who let these patients in the practice in the first place? (laughs) Well, of course, you did, or your front desk. And I'm suggesting, again, we don't want Busy, busy for the sake of being busy. Mm -hmm. Slow it down. Have better interviewing, triaging, maybe even uh, teledentistry to weed some people out before they even cross your threshold and put the doctor in an ethical, legal dilemma that you've got to do something for them because they got in your office, so to speak. And here's where I disagree with a lot of consultants. And I would say, feel free to discuss your fees over the telephone. So perhaps 
Mrs. Jones called up, new patient. Uh, I'd like to make an appointment to get my teeth clean. They always say that. That's all they know. <laughs> say, well, Miss Jones, I'm glad you uh, called us. How did you happen to hear about us? And uh, have you been in town for a while or where are you from? I said, no, no, I just moved from three states away. All right. Well, welcome to the community. Glad to have you. Uh, tell me a little bit about your previous dental experience. Um, did your previous dentist have any items outstanding that uh, he said you probably ought to get taken care of at some point that maybe he's been watching? And I'm not sure there's a 9,000 code for watching, by the way. But anyway, <laughs> um, just yelling. Uh, he was saying at some point, you know, I, I really have two suspicious teeth that might might, might need a crown. Well, Ms. Jones, I'm glad you called us because Mr. Uh, Dr. Smith is one of the best guys in town to do really quality crowns, does a great job of that. And here's where I depart. I'd say, now, Ms. Jones, we don't know what kind of crown you need. You may not realize there's a whole bunch of different crowns, and we'll determine that when you get here. But to be transparent and to give you an idea of our practice, our crowns range in price from maybe $1,400 to $1,800. And then you shut up. And if Ms. Jones says, uh-huh, now that means you've got permission to continue on. She's heard those kind of numbers before. But if you hear Mrs. Jones almost drop the phone and audibly gasp and say, <laughs> what? That, that, that can't be right. And I saw two exits back on the expressway. Dr. Green does crowns for $400. Yes, ma'am, I think Dr. Green does that. But as I mentioned in our office, the kind of crowns we do run between $1,400 and $1,800. I want that person to know up front there probably isn't a fit. Let them vote themselves off the island before they become one of your 60 new patients, only to leave later on and wasted your time and PPE supplies. Mm, that's true. Yeah. Remember... All you have to sell is like an airline. All you can sell is chair time. An airline would love to have just first-class passengers. That's not realistic. But that's what you'd love to have. People who will let you utilize each of your hours productively and not just have a bunch of hours racing between three chairs. Mm-hmm. So those are some other KPIs to give you an idea of what the, again, I hate to use the word, but the quality of the patients you get. Are they consistent when you first meet the new patient? Ms. Jones, glad you came to our office. I want to let you know, let's make sure we're on the same wavelength here. Our objective is to help you keep your tea for the rest of your life. Is, is that what you had in mind? Is it, no, no, no. I just have this one toothache I wanted you to fix. And then, uh, you know, that's about it. That may suit you okay, but at least you know you've smoked them out. <laughs> is that, in fact, the kind of patient you want? If she says, well, yeah, that's what, I, what I'm hoping for, Doc. Well, you know, Miss Jones, what that means is we really need to see you twice a year and that type of thing. And so you get smaller number um, quote, good patients. I see. Well, that's if you don't have the nerve to do that and the confidence in your communication skills, et cetera, frankly, you may not be able to get out of the PPO plans. You are stuck with the busy, busy model. Mm -hmm. But if you have some semblance of personality, and certainly the front desk has a great personality, and you've replaced the orange shag carpet sometime in the last century, you may have a quality kind of image and practice and friendliness that will attract patients. Remember, a lot of your patients are already driving past 10 other offices to come to you. They actually like you. <laughs> That's right. That's and your team, and they trust you, et cetera. That's right. Now, 
You don't have to be Johnny Carson or Jay Leno or you know, Kimmel or any of the, that kind of personality, but at least be reasonably personable and have some degree of chairside manner. In our CPA practice, we had a gal at the front desk, which is what I would suggest every doctor's office have, just all bubbly personality, kisses the babies, hugs the grandmothers, all that kind of stuff. I frankly don't care if your front desk person can add or not. Mm -hmm. We can add later. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I went up to the front desk one time and we had a big glass front where we could see the parking lot. And she says, oh, here comes Jimmy. I said, who's Jimmy? Oh, that's the UPS guy. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Jimmy walks in. Hey, Jimmy, how you doing? Doing great. Uh, how's David doing? Who the heck is David? That's a son who plays third base for the blah, blah, blah. And so she knew all this baloney I could hear the less about as a CPA, as you can imagine. <laughs> but he feels loved. And I'm not bad in the operatory of being reasonably pleasant. And maybe somebody wrote me a big note. Don't forget to ask about David's baseball game. Right. But a lot of dentists, especially the ones that have your know, fantastic margins measured in microns, they really don't have the personality necessarily to be a, a successful dentist facing the patients. I taught at several dental schools for a number of years, I was an adjunct faculty, and every year I'd make the professor mad because somewhere during the semester I'd tell the, the class, says, look, guys, you know, someday, 20 years from now, you're going to roll me and the professor in our wheelchairs to your 20th anniversary. But you know what? I can tell you today who's going to be the most successful in 20 years. Everybody's leaning forward, especially the guys that are top of the class. And I said, it's going to be the B and C students at Pizza Parlor all the time, beer in the hallways and stuff like that. <laughs> right. What? Are you kidding me? Well, who would you rather go to? What CPA would you rather go to? Somebody's nice, fun, has some personality. Say with everybody else you deal with, whether it's the air conditioning man, the automobile fellow, whatever, have some modicum of personality. Now, I'd love it if you're a fantastic dentist too, but I tell the folks who think they're fantastic dentists, they are fantastic clinicians, but the patient doesn't know or care. Mm -hmm. And so... You, Mr. A plus clinician, you've got to develop some degree of personality and empathy and caring for the patient. Your clinical skills alone are not going to cut it. Mm -hmm. If you just don't like to have personality and things like that, I'd say go work for one of the big box boys mm -hmm. and do exquisite work. But don't be the one to be the rainmaker, attract the patient's and things like that. And you know who you are, if that's you. Don't try to put a square peg in a round hole, and you may not be able to you know, get out of the PPMs. You are truly relying upon them to give you business. But I'd sure study that question hard to see if we can't send you off to a personality training school or something <laughs> and, and give you more options. Right. Well, those were some great tips, Mr. Williford, and I'm sure our listeners and audience would truly appreciate them. Aside from just, you know, focusing on the key performance indicators, but also paying attention to the relationship side of dentistry and understanding that that is what helps with your recare program, connecting with someone on a more human level. And I feel like more and more of that is forgotten or just the amount of work is just making people not focus on it on that part as much, but that's also an important com component. And I'm, I'm actually happy that Mr. Williford brought that up, even though a lot of you people may think that, oh, I thought I was listening in on this episode to talk about quantitative, you know, indicators. Why are we talking about this? But I feel like they go hand in hand. So thank you, Mr. Williford, for bringing that up. Yep. Yep. Because again, we want to know the why mm -hmm. behind the KPIs and we don't like them. And we do want to practice by design and not by default. That's right. How do we change the KPIs? How do we move the needle? That's right. That's right. 
And that's where the consulting types like Robert and you guys mm -hmm. know how to do that for that kind of practice. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you for being on our show. We're almost out of time, but we truly, I personally really appreciated you making the time to be on our episode today. All right. Sounds good. And we haven't gotten to all the KPIs yet, but that's certainly enough to, to hold them through supper time, I think, get that, them started. That is true. That is true. <laughs> that is right. That is right. And certainly we will talk more about that and all maybe right. have like, you know, an additional part to this. So thank you for listening in. We look forward to you reaching out to us. Thank you. Thanks for listening today. Be sure to subscribe to Beyond by Wings on your favorite podcast platform. For more information, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Or reach out to us on our website. You can also shoot us an email at info at e and associates.com.